Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Danny Paranormal and today we're going to be discussing BTK. Trigger warning. Today's topic discusses murder and sexual details, so viewer discretion is advised. Did you guys know that BTK eluded the police for 30 years? Alright, so let's talk about Dennis Rader, who is BTK. And if you don't know what BTK stands for, it was a name that he gave himself, which stands for Bind, Torture, Kill. Lovely, right? So, Dennis Rader was born March 9th, 1945 in Wichita, Kansas. Um, he was the oldest of four children. Dennis Rader's parents were pretty average parents from what he admitted. His dad was an airplane mechanic, his mom was a homemaker, and he said he had a pretty average childhood uh he reported no abuse however it is said that he may have had a turbulent relationship with his father because his dad was more strict and he wasn't a very like he wasn't a very emotional man so he didn't really like spend a lot of time with the kids he was working a lot so maybe that could have contributed to something his father also was reported to be a somewhat controlling person. Raider, however, was described as a normal child. He was a good student and he was involved in his church and Boy Scouts. He admitted later that he did practice by torturing small animals and he had fantasies of killing women and he liked bondage and pornography and it started at an early age but let's get back to the other side of things he did graduate from wichita heights high school and then he went to was lion i'm not sure how to pronounce that name university where he dropped out after a year after he dropped out he joined the Air Force from 1966 to 1970, and then he went on to marry his wife, Paula Dietz, and they got married in 1971. And they had two children together, Carrie and Brian. In 1973, he went to Butler Community College and he earned his Electronics Associates degree. In 1979, he graduated from Wichita State University with a Bachelor of Science degree, and he majored in Administration of Justice. The most notable job that he had was in 1974 when he worked for ADT services, security services, installing alarms. And this is where he got the layouts for some of the houses and picked his victims for his later crimes. In 1991, he worked as a dog catcher and he apparently was very strict and he also liked to pick on single women a lot he even killed one of his neighbor's dogs i'm not sure why um there wasn't a lot of description about what was going on with a dog it just mentioned that he killed dog so even after all of this was going on, he was elected for the president of the Christ Lutheran Church where he was attending and also the Cub Scout leader. Please explain, please. So Raider did have a lot of other jobs, but I just wanted to mention like a couple of them because I mean, it would be a really long video if we went into every single one of them. We're also not going to go into every single murder and all the details of them because it would be an extra long video. So we're just going to mention a few. We'll go into a few of the details 
and then we'll end the video there. But we're going to start talking about the murders and we'll talk about some of the things that he said there. So his very first murder was the Otero family. And it was just four members of the Otero family. And that was in 1974 on January 15th. Um, so Raider held the family at gunpoint in their home. Uh, what he said in a statement that you can find on YouTube actually you can also find a written statement as well from the courtroom if you would like he held them at gunpoint and he had them lay down in the living room at which he ended up taking them both to one bedroom and then he tied them up he started with Mr. Otero, which is Joseph Sr., and he put a plastic bag over his head and then tied a cord around it. Then he moved on to Mrs. Otero, Julie, and he did the same thing. So, at that point, he moved on to Josephine and then at that point he realized that Mr. Otero was not dead apparently like you know this being his first crime he was not very good at committing crimes so and this is according to him in his statement he had to go back and forth to his victim like he just kept messing up so he said he had to put a t-shirt over Mr. Otero and then another bag. And then he had to keep going back and forth and he kept thinking someone was dead and he was wrong. So then he went, after he put the t-shirt and the, and the thing over Mr. Otero, he went back to Mrs. Otero and he retightened her cords back to Josephine then back to Joseph Jr. and I believe at this point uh, Joseph Sr. was passed away so but Mrs. Otero was still coming back and forth from the brink of death and he says it like he was doing this accidentally but police believe that he was doing this on purpose like he kept bringing them back from the brink of death on purpose because he liked doing it so you know, he was saying that it was because it was like a messy thing. He wasn't sure what he was doing. But police believe that he was just doing it for fun. Like, he just kept doing it. Because, like, when the bodies were found, they were found with, like, bloated faces. Which, which means that they were being strangled, strangled, strangled. And then, un like, they were released from their strangling. And then they were being strangled again and again and again but they were allowed to catch their breath and then you know same thing happening over and over again okay so eventually he takes Joseph Jr. to another bedroom where he does the same thing that he did to Mr. Otero where he puts the t-shirt or a piece of cloth over him and the plastic bag and he leaves him there but then he takes Josephine to the basement where he hangs her and uh, in his word he has sexual fantasies I will leave it there because it's 
really sick. The next murder was of Catherine Bright on April 4th, 1974. This occurred when he broke into her home and waited for her to arrive. He was not expecting her brother Kevin to be with her. Um, what happened was he had one of them tie the other up. He says he can't remember which one he had tie who up. Um, doesn't matter. One of them tied the other up. He put Kevin in a room by himself and had Catherine in the living room. Um, he started to strangle Catherine in the living room, but then he heard Kevin making a struggle or a fuss. They ended up having a fight. He shot Kevin twice with one of the guns that he brought with him. And then he went back into the living room and proceeded to fight with Catherine, who he said wasn't being strangled or it wasn't working properly in his mind. So he kept trying different things. He ended up stabbing her three times. And then he realized that there was something happening or there were like noises happening when he realized that Kevin, the brother, had escaped. So he was like, well, shit. So at that point, he hurried up and cleaned up some of the stuff because he thought that the police were going to be definitely on the way. And he ran to the door and saw that the brother, Kevin, was running down the street. He had parked his car on another street and he had ran as fast as he could to the other street. He tried to take the car, but he had the wrong set of keys because, like, whenever he broke in, he usually told a lie that he needed the keys to the car. He did end up making it to his car in time before the police had arrived. He did not wear a mask to the Oteros, and he did not wear a mask to the Brights. I do not know whether he wore a mask to any of the other murders. He continued killing until 1991 and sending taunting letters to the police until 2005 when he was eventually caught using a public library to make a floppy disk. So here is a list of the other victims and dates. All of these victims were strangled except for one, which is Kevin Bright, who is the only known survivor, um, who was shot. So we have Kevin Bright. We already mentioned him. Um, that was April 474, along with his sister, who did not make it. She later succumbed to her injuries. We have Shirley Vianne Relford, March 17th, 1977. Nancy Fox, December 8th, 77. Maureen Hedge, April 27th, 1985. Vicki Wiggerly and Dolores E. Davis, February 1st, 1991. The floppy disk isn't the only way that he got caught, though. There was also DNA evidence, which we will get to in a minute. There was one incident where the police received a letter from someone claiming to be BTK, writing about the Fager family death and stating that it was admirable work. They never concluded that this was actually BTK, and they never tied this murder to the BTK Dennis Raider. Another note about the Fager family, I didn't look into that one because I don't know that that, if it was related to it, I don't know if that has been solved since. So here's a trail of evidence that sealed the deal for BTK, Dennis Rader. There was evidence that they caught on CCT of Dennis Rader. They didn't know that's who it was at the time. Of someone at Home Depot putting a cereal box 
in the back of a truck at Home Depot. The cereal box had evidence that pertained to some of the cases. The person threw it out at their house because they were like thinking that it was a joke and luckily they didn't take the trash out at their house and police were able to obtain the evidence. The only thing is they didn't actually get Dennis Rader on camera, however they were able to see the person getting into a, a Jeep Cherokee. Then, through the newspaper, they were able to get him to do the floppy disk that got him caught on the library computer. He sent it in, and they were able to find that on the metadata from the floppy disk, that it had been edited by someone named Dennis. Not only that, they were able to see that it was linked to Christ Lutheran Church. They looked up Christ Lutheran Church and were able to find that there was a Dennis Rader listed as the president of Christ Lutheran Church. They knew they had the guy, but they needed some solid evidence, DNA evidence. Police obtained a warrant for one of one of the pap smears from Dennis's daughter's doctor's offices, and they were able to run that DNA against Vicki Wegerly's fingernails. There was DNA under her fingernails. They ran it against that, and there was a familiar a familial match against that DNA, so they were able to get Dennis Rader on that DNA. So they were able to arrest him on that and bring him in. They were also able to give Dennis Rader's wife an emergency, well not the police, but the state, an emergency divorce, which voided and the usual wait time for normal divorce in the state of Kansas, which I thought was an interesting fact. Dennis Rader pled guilty to 10 charges of first degree murder and was found to have possessions of the victims, including driver's licenses and jewelry. Dennis Rader is currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences in El Dorado Correctional Facility without the possibility of parole for 175 years. So, like, no parole. So, good. Good. So, basically, he was a monster. If you read further into all the things he did to his victims, binding them up, torturing him, doing other stuff that was disgusting. You'll see just how much of a monster this guy was. Like, he was no joke. He was a sicko. Ugh. I'm not even joking. <clears throat> I do have a book to recommend if you do want to read a little more about him. It's called Inside the Mind of BTK by John Douglas. It's a really good read. It's also not for the faint of heart. So I do have to put that out there. If you um, are squeamish, don't read it. Um, but if you are super into true crime, you don't like... If you have a strong stomach, go for it. But if you don't, stay away. I'm not even joking. So, um, oh, and also if, like, there are certain things, like, sexual things that bother you, then definitely stay away because it's full of that stuff. So, yeah. Okay. So, what are your thoughts about BTK? Um, this is, like, recent, but, like, I mean, it's 2005, so it's, like, 
like he was the big serial killer from my lifetime like my mom's lifetime was Jeffrey Dahmer mine was BTK so like what do you guys think um let me know in the comments below like what your thoughts are what like have you heard of BTK like if you're watching like is this the first time you're hearing of them? Like, there's a lot of you out there who may not, like, have heard about them for some reason. Like, maybe you were sheltered. Maybe, and I mean that in, like, a good way. Like, a lot of us didn't grow up watching true crime like I did with my mom. Like, I would be watching Unsolved Mysteries and I'd be watching, like... I don't know, Cold Case Files, That's that was our freaking, like, every night shows and stuff, so, I don't know, just, lots of you guys out there didn't do that all the time, and that's, I don't know, it's weird for me, because that was just normal for me, <laughs> and a lot of others of us out there, so, you know. But anyway, um, just let me know what you guys are thinking down below. Anyway, um, so I hope you liked the video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself and had an interesting, at least, time here. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out that book I mentioned. If you want to check out the weird courtroom thing I'll link it below and uh, if you never want to hear about BTK again I, I wouldn't blame you so I don't either hope you guys are having a great day and I will see you in the next video